almost acting as that consultant as well for our, our customers. You know, it's not just being a language services provider. We also cover 34 Indigenous languages, Braille, Australian Sign Language, and we deliver those services pretty much across any channel. 60% said they would use automated translation in some form to translate a company's presentation, product or service description. Court interpreters now are essentially being recalled to on-site work. And welcome to Slater Pod 82. Hi there, Esther. Hey, Florian. How are you? I'm good. I'm going to be even better next week. You know why? No. Because I'm going to be on a long European vacation. Ah, very nice. Where yes. are you headed? Uh, the usual. <laughs> the mountains. So, no, no, not much planned. Yeah, we were planning to go to Spain. I might have mentioned that. Uh, but in, in the fall. So now it's domestic. Uh, no, nah, and it's not, a, it's not one of those five-week European uh, vacations. It's a, a concise, short, two-week retreat in the mountains. Very nice. Cool. So today we have a great pot. Great guests. We got Liz Compton and Claire Mullins uh, from Language Loop joining us from the beautiful city of Melbourne in Australia. Looking forward to that conversation. And on the agenda today, we've got TikTok. Are you using TikTok? No. no. I'm too old. <laughs> <laughs> I'm too old too. It's too much. Uh, although some of the some of the TikToks are finding their way to Twitter. So Mm. I, I like to uh, see them on Twitter, but no, I, I, I don't TikTok either. Uh, so they were fined over a missing translation. We're going to look at that. Then our friends over at the European Union ran a quite a uh, significant website localization survey. We covered it last year, and now is a new edition. Then we're going to go out of the European Union again, over to Norway, up to Norway, rather, uh, interpreting tender framework, and then heading all over... Uh, west to the west coast to LA where there's a bit of a row involving interpreters. Hey, so the word row, is that even American English or is that is that it's English? I mean we use British. it in the UK. Yeah. yeah. Not sure. Well comment comment below if uh, <laughs> the word row is uh is is, is the US. I, I, I remember I heard it a lot when I lived in London. Yeah. Not so much during my time in San Diego. Mm. Anyways, TikTok, find over missing translation of privacy statement. What's going on at TikTok? Yeah. Um, well, I think I was, when I was reading up on this, I was expecting it to have been a heftier fine for <laughs> kind of the amount of uh, discussion and, you know, the, the high profile of the company involved. But um, yes, apparently TikTok has been issued with a uh, 0.75 million, 750,000 euro fine. So roughly uh, 888. Or roughly two seconds dollars. of cash flow. <laughs> right. Um, by the Dutch Data Protection Authority or the DPA. Um, so apparently they have been fined because uh, TikTok did not translate a privacy statement into Dutch. And according to the DPA, this violates the privacy of young children um, because the children cannot probably read English and may not be able to be aware of what it is that they're kind of signing up to. Um, so according to this DPA, TikTok failed to provide an adequate explanation of how the app collects, processes, and uses personal data. Um, however, TikTok has lodged an objection to the fine, we understand from local news. So there's two sides to this. On mm. the one hand, I would really like the Dutch Data Protection Authority to show me one single teenager that reads the privacy statement. Yeah. English, Dutch, or otherwise. That's yeah. the one side. Let's leave that aside. All right. On the more business side, the relevant side here for, for this podcast, um, you know, whether the fine's small or not, nobody wants to get fined. And True. obviously this is this doesn't hurt uh TikTok in the slightest, but it does show that, well, people are aware. Uh, like regulators are looking at this and you, you know you're going to have to have your ducks in a row and translate what needs to be translated so 
you know that's yeah, where the I mean whole... it certainly wouldn't hurt them financially but I guess it's more no. about the, the image and, and what it what it's kind of suggesting to to everybody um, but apparently yeah, now it's going to be up to the I, the island um, regulator because TikTok has since established formal operations in Ireland um, so like as much as the D, right all... yeah, yeah as much as the Dutch um, authority can or has issued this fine it sounds like the actual final decision or judgment is going to come from Ireland. Yeah, I mean, all the big tech companies, US and now obviously Chinese are also uh, are based in, in Ireland. I think originally it was, I mean, also a lot of the localization work is, is uh, still centralized around Ireland from, mm. from the big tech and, you know, Chinese big tech, um, you know, follows US big tech. So that's why Ireland, I mean, th- if I was a, a business developer or a salesperson, I'd just you mm. know mention this to my clients. I mean, just make sure that you get this uh, this done, right? I mean, you see TikTok got fined. You don't want to get fined. So mm. it's a nice arrow in the sales quiver if you go out there and you talk to, um, you know, people about, you know, regulated, I mean, regulations and, and how regulations drive translation demand. You know, with, yeah. on, the, on the merits of actually having this in Dutch and having, you know, like, I don't know, teens, twelve year olds read it. I mean, you know, it's it's regulation. I mean, that that's that's just on one side of the the side. I mean, that nobody nobody's gonna. I guess very few are gonna actually read it. But, um, but yeah, you have to do it. It's the law, and um, and that's uh, an area in the quiver for sales. Now, much more. Um, well, remaining. Let's say remaining with European Union regulators. Here's my segue. All right. Here's my segue. <laughs> European Union regulators. Um, the European Commission's DG Connect, uh, Director General for Communications Networks, Content and Technology, and the European Union's Director General for Internal Market Industry, Entrepreneurship, and SMEs. Yeah, I'm reading this. It's called DG Grow. Uh, they did a they did a survey, an interesting survey. We covered it a year ago, and now that they ran the second edition, they they asked 1,000 SMEs. Um, around their opinion to mm. uh, around website translation. Okay, I'm getting to the point here. The point is website translation and machine translation. So let me just rattle off a couple of stats here, and uh, we'll cover this in more detail uh, next week, I think. So 60% said they would use automated translation in some form to translate a company's presentation, product, or service description. Mm. All right, let's just leave that there for a second. 75% of the 1,000 expressed interest in participating in the European Commission's pilot, making their website automatically multilingual. And on average, they saw on average a 32% turnover increase, or they're expecting, sorry, on average, a 32% turnover increase if uh, by the SMEs if their website was available in more languages. So my question to you would be, why don't you do it if you're seeing a 30% turnover increase? I guess I get my website localized. Uh, interestingly, they're saying currently only 51% of websites' content is available in more than one language, while SMEs, again, expressed high potential for their translation needs. 45% would like to present their website in German, 40 in, in English, 40 in French, and 30% in Spanish. Um, mm. Let's just go back to the 60% we use automated translation in some form to translate the company's presentation, product, or service descriptions. I mean, what do we make of this? 60% seems high to empty your website. So That's not website stuff though, is it? This is presentation product or service description. So that would that are on the website though. At on okay, specifically on the yeah. website. So rather than I don't know the UX or whatever else. Yeah, no, no, it's on it's on the website. So but again, mm. that's not 60% are using MT to translate. 60% would use automate. So Basically, what you have here is a data point around the current kind of confidence in MT. So it's very high. Now, let's say those 60% actually go ahead and use it. Then, mm. well, would, 60, w- w- would those 60% still be happy having the MT content if they get a lot of feedback from their customers and, and, and website visitors around you know, potential issues with the MT? Well, so, they might be happy if they see a 32% increase in turnover. <laughs> You're right. So, <laughs> good. Uh, yeah, not if they have a uh, not if they have a fifty percent increase in complaints. 
maybe not. No, maybe then all of that extra revenue is going towards uh, customer service personnel to uh, respond service. to all of the angry users. I don't know. I think we should leave it there. We we unpack this uh, very deeply, as our listeners surely appreciate. Uh, They also did a a user survey around the e translation. I'm not going to go through that. Uh, We'll um, Mm. we'll let people read it when it's when it's on the website. Anyway, interesting data point. And you know, uh, surveying a thousand SMEs takes a a lot of data and quite a lot of work. So appreciate the work that uh, the European Union did there, and we'll we'll cover this uh, next week. Heading up to the north of the European continent, which is not in the European Union, not the Northwest in Norway, but also there. There's a lot of interpreting and translation going on. Uh, Esther, tell us more about that new framework agreement. Yes, this is a framework agreement or rather a tender that has been launched for a framework agreement um, in Norway and by Norway's Labour and Welfare Authority or NAV. Uh, Can I just pause you for a second? Yeah. The NAV must be very big. You know why? When I looked them up on Shutterstock, our image database, there Mm. were four or five Shutterstock images with the NAV logo. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, you typically don't expect that. Like that means it's a very large organization. Like I think if you looked for some kind of obscure government subunit, you typically don't get stock footage of of those. So That's I think a good the, NAV, point. Yeah. the NAV's a pretty powerful organization. Powerful organization. Yes. They and <laughs> in they Norway. are involved in um uh, immigration, so specifically helping immigrants to integrate into Norway uh when they when they arrive. Um I mean among other things I think, but as it pertains to kind of interpreting and language services, this is a, a, a big consideration for them. Um and they've said that apparently they have observed more uh, unemployment among immigrants since the start of COVID um, and also general trends in immigration to Norway could possibly lead to more demand or more need for interpreting and interpreters. Mm. So they have launched a framework agreement, uh, like we said, worth um, an estimated 40 million euros or around 47 million Dollars that's specifically for interpreting services. But as we know, for framework services, sorry, framework agreements, it's it's rarely kind of guaranteed volumes, and a lot of this is, I suppose, ad hoc um, and somewhat difficult to to predict in the way in the way of volumes. Um, but interested parties, so people who want to uh, participate in the tender, have. Um, until mid-August, so August the 18th, to apply uh, for the contract. And the contract is expected to last for two years, plus two possible one-year extensions. So a maximum duration of of four years, I believe. Um, Yeah, and and it is big. You said NAV is big. We found that they had nearly 300 offices, I believe, across Norway. Uh, Some, the remote... Uh, interpreters and also in-person interpreters are required for the NAV offices that would have direct contact with you know, immigrants or users of interpreting services. However, um, apparently if both parties, so if the person seeking uh, the help of NAV and the NAV um, employee, uh, if both of them speak English uh, sufficiently well, the NAV can offer guidance in English. Uh, kind okay. of interestingly as well yeah 300 i mean norway is a country of fi- barely 5 million people so if they have 300 offices that's uh hmm. you know that's pretty much in every town village and uh yeah you know, i mean i'm not sure if town. all of them are kind of contact centers so i don't know whether all of them would be like, receiving members of the public or if some of them are more you know admin yeah. offices mm. yeah the framework contracts huh um co- you know, looks like just the uh, yeah the way to go in Europe. The UK has a bunch of them. Scandinavia generally has has a lot. So the typical bidders for this would be like the Hero Talk, the Sprock Center maybe from Sweden, and then the like the semantics of this world. Uh, so let's see who's making it onto this this uh, this list. Seems so. Yeah. Moving to California, where. Also, interpreters are mm. uh, not happy. Why are they not happy in the beautiful town of Los Angeles? 
Yeah, the poor interpreters. Um, well, so this is kind of a response to uh, end, the end of social distancing requirements, um, I think, in in the state, potentially. Um, but, or sorry, in the county, I think in LA County, Los Angeles. But so court interpreters now are essentially being recalled to on-site work. Um, and a mm -hmm. number of them have actually received return to work letters that are apparently ordering them back to the county courthouses um, before a certain date. Um, so that means that they will no longer be able to work in a remote manner as they have been doing uh, during COVID, I imagine, for the most part. Um, but we, this is, um, there's a there's a workers union, a sort of agency workers union that is, is uh, lobbying on their behalf called the California Federation of Interpreters. Um, and I mean, they obviously have an objection to this new requirement uh, and are asking, um, well, really for either an extension or for some consideration to be given to interpreters who might not want to uh, or be able to go back um, on site to, to the courts, to the courthouses. Um, so, yeah, like I said, this has kind of come, I think it started um from the end of June when the LA County courthouses actually rescinded the social social distancing. So at the moment, there are no restrictions to public access to the courthouses, but wearing of face masks is mandatory. Um, but as part of this kind of move back to in-person uh, way of doing things, the courts no longer offer what they call a remote audio attendance program. So this was mm -hmm. used um, nicely shortened to the RAAP or RAP. Uh, this was used during COVID to listen remotely to courtroom, courtroom proceedings. Um, but it was only supposed to be a temporary solution. This is according to the courts, or at least um, what the CFI, the Workers' Union, told us that the court said. Um, that apparently the courts have some um, concern that this kind of audio uh, RAP audio remote attendance program um, is open to abuse because it, people could essentially record, film, uh, maybe distribute the court proceedings. Um, and apparently there were also um, widespread public breaches recently. Um, so this is the motivation for the courts wanting to go back to in-person proceedings. Um, That's a good point. Uh, yeah. Didn't really think about this. Yeah. I mean, if you do it remote, I mean, not I mean, obviously not the interpreter, but someone else might be dialing in here, and then yeah, you can you can record. Mm. Also, isn't there kind of a trade-off if you're still masking in the courtroom? I mean, just from yeah. a interpreter's point of view, it's also not super easy to interpret mm. somebody with a mask on. So I wonder what's easier sure. from an interpreter's point of view: recording, uh, sorry, um, interpreting a remote interpreting remotely or interpreting somebody who has a mask who's masking yeah. i don't know like what, what's Covered. what's diff what's more difficult both, both is, i mean maybe they would also have to deal with both scenarios because if um the interpreters are remote from the court proceedings but the court proceedings are taking place uh in the court Yes, then right. even if the interpreters are remote, then the participants would still be wearing a mask. So I would have thought that that would be doubly difficult for that reason. Yeah, you're right. probably that was the case until now. I mean, if you're a defendant, you're not going to sit at home in most mm. cases. <laughs> you're probably in the court. I mean, I think it's all kind of part of the wider discussion, isn't it? That um, of employees or workers returning to offices and various different sites where, uh, you know, during, for the past 18 months or so, People have been holding up the economy to, or holding down jobs, supporting businesses remotely from their from their living rooms. So, you know, calling people back to work immediately or, or enforcing it is it seems a little bit unfair. But I mean, maybe mm. you know, in this kind of situation, there's there's more at stake and more going on than what we probably appreciate. But as far as I understand it, it is an evolving story, and I think we probably will be following up on it as well. Yeah, we should. Um, what about the UK? Is it fully open? Freedom Day has passed and like every, everything's <laughs> back, no masks or how is the situation? Yes, uh, for the most part, yeah. No masks required in most 
situations, except if you're using public transport or I think in health settings, so if you go to the to the doctors, to the GP, they ask you to wear one still. However, and I think I said this earlier that um, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of cases and there are a lot of people being contacted either directly yes, yeah. or via the app to have to self isolate. So it's it's open, but then people are being asked to stay at home. So. I wonder how this is in the UK now with the, the court. I mean, there's all these, uh, I mean, the Ministry of Justice, one of the, the very big buyers of mm. interpreting services, right? And um, how are they managing it at the moment? Mm. Uh, yeah, let's go to a part of the world where uh, the situation is a lot stricter than in the UK and in California to Melbourne, Australia, which I think just emerged from a, uh, a, a pretty strict lockdown where people actually mm. were asked to stay at home. So... Looking forward to the conversation with uh, Liz and Claire from Language Loop. Yeah. And welcome back to SlaterPod. Today with Elizabeth and Claire. It's great to have you on here at SlaterPod. Hi, Liz. Hi, Claire. Hello. Hi, Hi Claire. Hi, Hi Esther. Guys. Welcome. Hi, Esther. Thank you. Very pleased to be here. Absolutely joining us uh, from Australia. So Elizabeth Comp, uh, you're the CEO at Language Loop, which is uh, among Australia's leading language service providers. And, uh, and Claire Mullins, you're Language Loop's national translation manager. And just a brief wave introduction. I think Language Loop is around a $25 million uh, Aussie dollar organization and uh, headquartered in Melbourne. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, so good evening from Melbourne. It's good morning there in, in Europe. Yeah, but indeed, we're, we're headquartered here in, in Melbourne. Um, we're about to clock over 28 million uh, revenue in a Aussie dollars. Um, but yeah, been growing uh, very rapidly over the last few years. Great, great. Uh, let's let's look a little bit about your background, both of you, Liz and uh, and Claire. So, Liz, you joined the business, uh, I think, around 2016, right? And you had a an international career before that in business with like Goldman Sachs and some other companies. So, what attracted you to this particular challenge and and this industry? We always like to ask our guests, like, how how did they end up in the language industry? So, tell us your story here. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Florian. Um, in, indeed, I was overseas uh, for the best part of a, a decade, working in Europe and the U.S. and in executive um, and leadership roles. So that was in corporate affairs, uh, strategic planning, sales and marketing. And so, as you as you highlighted, a number of years there with Goldman Sachs. Um, so financial services, um, automotive. Um, so a number of different sectors. So I came back to uh, Australia and, and worked um, in, in government roles. And then when I saw this role, I guess um, all I saw was potential when I researched Language Loop or as it was known then, VITS. Um, all I saw was potential. And if I looked back at my experience overseas, internationally, across different sectors, also here in Australia in, in government, um, and doing some research into to language services, I knew that it could be so much more than it was at that point in time. So I was just incredibly excited. And I think that that um, balance of an, an organisation that has such incredible purpose and importance in terms of the service that we deliver back to non-English speakers, helping them to participate in society, um, you know, helping give a voice to people to settle in, in Australia, but also we're a commercial entity. So bringing that real business um, side and growth mindset to, to the organisation as well. Um, so it was kind of that combination of things that really attracted me to the role. So no regrets so far. Absolutely not. <laughs> all right. All right. Claire, t tell us a bit more about your background. How did you uh, get involved with the language industry? Yeah, thanks, Florian. So I guess my pathway to the language services industry took more of a traditional route than, than Liz's. So as you can hear from my accent, I'm originally from Ireland. I'm not Australian. I grew up and studied in, in Ireland. Um, so I graduated from Dublin City University there in um, with a at Bachelor of Arts in Translation and Interpreting Studies. And directly after graduating, I worked as a technical German translator for a multinational German software company. Um, so it was a brilliant first step into the industry. I had the opportunity to work with um, their proprietary machine translation engine. Um, so this is back in 2004 when machine translation was really in its infancy, I suppose, in the industry in terms of broad application um, from a pro professional perspective. Um, so in that capacity, I was also involved in training um, some of our German LSPs that we outsourced a lot of content to as well. 
And then I decided to move to Australia to backpack for a year. And 12 years later, I'm still here um, <laughs> where I, I've moved into um, more management positions. So I started out in project management firstly and then um, moved into program management and uh, to my role here at Language Loop, which is head of the translations department. What a surprise, getting stuck in, in Australia of all places. Uh, how, <laughs> I know, how's terrible your German? place to be stuck. <laughs> a terrible place. Uh, how's your German? Um, look, it has diminished over the years. I have to say it's probably not as, as good as it used to be. I did spend um, a year in, in Heidelberg when I was uh, living in Europe. But um, yeah, I just don't have those same opportunities to, to really practice as, as much as I would have back in, in Ireland or Europe. Yes, um, so to me with Liz, you mentioned the language. name change um, of the organization from, I think it was Victorian Interpreting and Translation Service or VITS to Language Loop. Can you yeah. tell us a bit yeah. more about the origin story of the company here and the decision to rebrand? Yeah, sure. So we were actually uh, established back in the late 1970s. So um, the entity, I guess, the government realized and, and knew that it had a very important role to play um, in access and equity for newly arrived migrants and refugees um, back back in the late 70s. So we were really established around um, that foundation and core value of, of access and equity. Um, and we're very much focused in those early days on providing sort of on-site interpreting services within um, government, so whether that be in the health system, the legal system, education. Um, and I guess we've, over the years, and certainly in the last 10 years, really transformed who we are and how we operate. So all we, always with that core around access and equity and making sure that we're delivering an absolute seamless service to our government clients and to non-English speakers accessing those government services. But we've also grown. So we now deliver um, language services for very large multinational companies um, and also in the not-for-profit and, and community sector. So we're very much um, a different, I guess, organisation with that same core though. So it, it um, I guess we had the name the Victorian Interpreting and Translation Service. It didn't really represent um, who we were or who we are. Uh, so we really wanted to make sure that we had an, an identity and a brand that represented our national footprint um, and that we, you know, offer a very, you know, digital service as well. So we've been through a digital transformation and organisational transformation, really looking at that end to end customer journey or if you're a patient in a, in a health system, your, your the pa patient's journey as well. So, yeah, it was really about making sure that we had a, a brand that reflected the true sort of scale and scope of, of who we are and what we do. Mm -hmm. It's actually quite an interesting setup, I have to say. I don't think I recall many comparable organizations actually in, in the world. Esther, does, does anybody come to mind? I mean, I, I haven't seen anybody that's kind of brand like mm. a private sector company operates like a private sector company but is is working closely with the government there, there's um, a few, very very I think interesting there's one setup. or two here in the uk actually on the interpreting side specifically i wouldn't be able to recall the name right now mm. yeah exactly you don't recall the name <laughs> so in terms of the branding <laughs> i think language line uh, sorry language loop does it does a great job so uh, um Liz, tell us a bit more about when you work with, with your government stakeholders. How, do, how does that work? How do you interact with them? Is there like, I don't know, quarterly meetings and how do you report to them or they report to you? Yeah, so I guess like any shareholder, it just happens that our shareholder is is the Victorian state government. So we report quarterly. Um, so we report to the Department of Treasury and Finance and also to the Minister for Multicultural Affairs. So we have those dual reporting lines. Um, and it, it's really no different. We are very much, I guess, guided by government policy and, and going back to what makes us sort of different and being that very interesting breed between a commercial entity, but also owned by the, the government. We are we are very much supported by the Victorian state government in terms of policy and direction, um, but we don't appropriate any funds from, from the government. So we're completely hmm. um, self-funded and, in fact, we pay a dividend back to government, um, just like a commercial entity would pay dividends um, back, back to shareholders. And um, so we've talked a little bit about interpreting and some of the customer base, but, I mean, what is... Just maybe in a nutshell, what is Language Loop's sort of core offering? Uh, what do you think are some of the most important client segments that you that you serve? 
Yeah, so we've got, um, I guess, three clear client segments. So mm -hmm. that is government, um, that's both Victorian state government and federal government. Uh, commercial entities, so that's large financial institutions, insurers, utilities, um, and this third segment would be in that not-for-profit um, and community sector. So we service um, all three sectors and we've been growing all three, uh, certainly over the last five to ten years. And we have a full service offering, so something that makes us a little bit different is that whether that sort of on-site interpreting, telephone interpreting, video interpreting, all kinds of translation services, digital services that Claire can talk to. We also cover 34 Indigenous languages, uh, Braille, Australian Auslan, Australian Sign Language, um, and we deliver those services pretty much across any channel and any touch point. So however a customer or patient wants to interact with a government service or a commercial entity, uh, we facilitate that through through any channel that are across those key uh, government, um, commercial and not-for-profit and community sectors. Hmm. Is there any um, international component to, to Language Loop's business? Uh, um, uh, oh, sorry. Oh, okay, <laughs> come in jump in there um so no i guess um to date our focus really has been on the domestic market um and we really do see that there continues to be a huge demand from our local contracts specifically across government and um, that's at a state level that's victoria where we are at the moment and nationally at the federal level that liz mentioned earlier and i guess um one of the the buzzwords of the past 18 months has been COVID-19 and so I mean in Australia we've really seen that that's accelerated that conversation around multilingual engagement and um, you know much more inclusive public information campaigns and so not only um, government but businesses now are really realizing the importance of engaging with their customers in in other languages and that you know, not only that access and, and equity side of things, but the ability to really engage with their customers on a deeper level and gain those business uh, insights that, that we can give them through our language services. So you, you said um, access and equity, right? Uh, so in Australia, for you, for your business in particular, but maybe also for, for the broader market, where do you see kind of the key drivers for, on the one hand, the translation localization? And then for, for the interpreting services part, what are some of the key drivers of demand here, uh, you know, from, from your view, but maybe also broader? Yeah, I guess, um, I mean, the, the first thing to note is that Australia isn't a hugely multicultural country. I think something like 23% of um, Australian citizens speak a language other than English at home. And so, you know, it's been built and continues to be built on these waves of immigration. So from that angle, um, historically, demand has been driven by government and government policy and that importance of um, allowing any person in Australia to access critical health services and educational services. And this facil facilitates that pathway to integration. So it's just that critical first um, point to a more cohesive uh, country, I guess. And then, um, as we mentioned earlier, secondly, we're really beginning to see that commercial entities now are also really trying to engage with their customers. So um, by adding language services, you know, support uh, for their products and services in other languages, they're really able to gain a competitive advantage there. Um, and interestingly enough, we, we conducted some, some research recently um, in, into multilingual um, consumer behaviours in Australia. And so our research, it was modelled quite closely on CSA uh, researches, um, very famous, very, very used can't read, won't buy um, uh, survey that they pretty much run out every couple of years. And we found that the, the results were very com comparable to that international research. So I think I've got some stats in front of me here. We found that um, if a, a product or a service was offered in another language, 74% of multilingual Australians would buy more services or products from that business. 90% would recommend that business to a friend or family member. And 74% would be a lot more loyal to that business. So that is really a big driver. It's a big commercial and business driver for uh, many of the um, organizations that we're, we're servicing at the moment. A quick follow-up on, on the domestic side. Is that m like overwhelmingly first generation uh, immigrants or would it also go into the second generation like in Australia would second generation be almost like disconnected from the her the, the origin or is that what are the dynamics there 
It really depends on. So, you know, we've got such a broad um, client base, I guess. And so, for example, if you're serv servicing and an old age um, facility, for example, you know, we are really going to be offering services to those first generation um, of Australians who, who really still struggle sometimes with the English language. Um, but we're also really seeing that, you know, kind of newer, highly educated migrants coming into Australia who are very proficient in the English language, but still also like and, you know, like to integrate, like to you know, use digital services in their own languages, for example. So they, they mm. might very well be able to interact in English, but it's just a, a preference to be able to have that additional support or, you know, information just available in your language. Got it, got it. Yeah. Um, and thinking about the different customer base, what would you say are some of the key differences between, you know, your private sector clients your and public sector that you work with? Are there any sort of dynamics or any things that steps st stick out as being very different from one from the other? Uh, yeah, it's an interesting question. And, and Claire and I were, were talking about this in uh, our client base, and we came to the conclusion that there's, uh, I think, definitely been a, a convergence of needs and wants from both those um, client bases and it's very clear that both now want um, absolutely high quality services that goes without saying cost effective transparent and we we generally um, gain most of our work through a procurement process or a tender process um, and quality is really high so we we really have to dial up and demonstrate how we deliver an incredibly high quality um, outcome and with that comes very strong expectations around um, account management, um, customer service. And what we've seen in the probably the last two to three years is a really strong push for, for insight, insight into data. And I think when you see that, you know, the great growth in big data and um, data analytics, what we see is our clients want that insight from their multilingual or multilingual uh, customer base, multicultural customer base. So it's not just about saying, you know, here's a report of, you know, your top 20 languages and, and the demand. Um, it, it's really like, well, what are the consumer preferences? Um, how can we more deeply engage with our customer base? How, how can we deliver a better service? to our multilingual um, clients, patients, customers. So yeah, there's, there's really been a, a convergence over the last few years around that absolute quality, but cost effective with the overlay of that data and insight as well. Yeah, I agree. I think we're seeing this in, in, in other markets as well that uh, the, those, uh, before that it was very much, not misaligned, but diff different buyer behaviors and now, uh, uh, public sector has really uh, kind of oriented itself uh, to the private sector much more mm. than before. Yeah. Let's move a bit to tech, technology, huge topic, of course, in both the translation and now with, with uh, COVID, uh, increasingly, of course, uh, also in the, in the interpreting space. So let's start a bit with translation services. How, how do you integrate all these kind of emerging and, and <laughs> already emerged machine translation services into your day-to-day uh, -day processes what are some of the key challenges there on, on the translation written translation side first yeah on the translation side i i won't lie it certainly has been a, a challenge um but interestingly for me um kind of coming from a european background and certainly working for um as i mentioned a, a multinational uh, organization which you know really based its growth and expansion on the provision of language services and um, it was really interesting to to see kind of how far behind in terms of technology Australia was at that time. And so when I started at Language Loop, so I've been uh, working here for about seven years now, and um, mm -hmm. really the, the major focus on the, the business was on the interpreting side, and, and certainly it's still a, a larger portion. It, it represents probably about 80% of the business. Um, but translations really remained quite underdeveloped in many respects. And so one of my key um, initiatives to, to grow um, and, and to, to, to kind of look at was the, the technology aspect. So um, part of uh, what I did was to, to scope out, um, you know, a translation management system even, um, you know, which we, we weren't using any tools whatsoever, no CAT tools, and um, certainly no machine translation whatsoever. Um, so only in the past two years have we actually integrated a, a translation management system into our everyday um, translation management, our workflow 
processes um, and that integrates into our core um, language booking system. Um, so, you know, you have the technology, obviously, on, on, one, on the one hand. And then, Florian, your, your question was about the, uh, the difficulties with the languages. Um, a huge part of that was the training and development of our language professionals, our translators, mm -hmm. um, many of whom had never worked with technology in the past. And so we really had to develop um, a, quite a comprehensive training program, um, starting with the, the very basics um, about you know, how, to, how to log into a system, what a, what a cat tool is, working within an editor, what term, base, term bases are. Um, so... I think um, in, in, the, in the two years since we, we've developed it, the translators have really embraced it and um, really see it as a, as a tool for, you know, a, a much more efficient way of working. Um, so it's, it's, been quite, it's been a success in, in that way. But certainly there still are issues uh, directly within the system with not supporting some fonts, for example, or not supporting some of the, the rarer languages. Um, we had a request for Jonka today, for example, which is the, the language of Bhutan. <laughs> and so I wouldn't have known. That's a, <laughs> <laughs> Certainly not a language that's supported directly within within our you know the system that we're using, um, but but on the whole, I mean, uh, it, it's great to kind of see the, how how it's been embraced and really how it's re revolutionized the way we work. Yeah, th those those nitty gritty details, you, you you'll never get rid of them. I mean, they'll just you know, no matter how mature of an organization, buy side uh, sell side you are ever, it, it, there's always going to be those types of languages. I already forgot the name. <laughs> Bhutan, interesting. Chonka, Chonka. Chonka, okay. I'll, it is, I'll look it's it got up. a nice sound. I like the way it kind of Absolutely. rolls off the tongue. <laughs> and then how about on the interpreting side then? Um, I mean, especially in the past 18 months, I think obviously a lot, a lot has changed or shifted because of the pandemic. And how has that um, impacted the way that you deliver interpreting? Um, and how did you kind of experience that shift to remote working? Yeah, thanks, Esther. Well, I think like around around the world, we've seen uh, that immediate shift um, and acceleration of, of digital delivery of services. So obviously, in, in our context of, of language services, that's been a huge shift from on site to remote um, interpreting and the pickup of, of digital services as well. So, I mean, just given the vastness um, of our of our country, we've always, well, for many years, have had remote um, remote interpreting. Um, but even within Australia, and given our geography, it's it still had been a bit of a, a struggle, especially in health settings, for clinicians to to use um, video interpreting or even telephone interpreting. You know, there was just that routine of having an on-site interpreter. Um, but as we've seen globally, there's nothing like a bit of necessity to, to push people forward. So we've, like the rest of the world, seen a very rapid shift and acceleration to the use of um, We've got an on-demand video interpreting app or using, we also have a, a process where we're technology agnostic around um, whatever platform our clients are using for, for video, we can integrate with that um, as well. So, you know, it's really been great to see and we were in a pretty good position anyway. Um, just as an example, a few years ago at the last Australian federal election, um, we actually had our video interpreting platform in polling stations around the country. So not only... Um, People who didn't speak English or, or uh, needed assistance uh, could tap into our video interpreting platform, but it was also used for Auslan as well. So it was an incredibly accessible, um, I guess, a voting ex experience. But um, yeah, like I said, we've seen that huge shift, huge growth in, in telephone and video interpreting. And we don't think, and, and I think this has come out some, from research in the industry, that we'll ever fully go back to the volumes of on-site interpreting that we had pre-COVID. There has been a shift and that shift is here to stay, although they'll always in you know very critical health or, or legal settings an on-site interpreter and will be required and will be a necessity um, and for maybe longer form interpreting assignments. But yeah, definitely that that shift to, to digital deliveries and remote deliveries here to stay. And when you're thinking about the on-demand um, video component, what are some of the key challenges, maybe from a linguistic or process perspective that make uh, maybe on-demand video interpreting maybe more challenging compared with uh, over the phone interpreting? Yeah, I guess um, in Australia, going back to the stats that Claire was referencing from our last census, 
we cover 180 odd languages, indigenous languages, so it's just a huge um, volume of, of different languages mm -hmm. to, to cover. So I guess there's always the, the chicken and the, the egg. You need the you need the client size demand. You also need the the supply. So it's just getting to those right levels where you've got a, a match, as we do now in in telephone interpreting. Um, and I guess what we've built into our system is what we called an um, ASAP functionality. So that connects our customer with an interpreter within 30 minutes. So it's not quite immediate, but when you're covering you know your top languages and you've got such a huge tail of languages that's really helped in fulfill those assignments um, and also we can tap into interpreters around around the country as well which which helps um, so look i think whenever you're going to market with a new service there's there are always going to be challenges um, and they're just some of the ones that we've experienced but you know there's always a solution that, that we're working to um, and we actually work with over 3,000 interpreters. So it's just a process of getting them on board, getting them used to the technology and making the, the interaction as seamless as possible. You mentioned language combinations. What are some of the top target languages that you interpret and then uh, have they shifted over the past five, 10 years or it's been pretty steady? Yeah, Mandarin, Vietnamese, um, Arabic, certainly the the top three and we've got you know some of the older post-world war ii migration languages from uh, italian um, would be a, a key one in greek um greek but Melbourne. we've seen uh new migrant waves from parts of africa for example so we're cert even though the, the volumes are still relatively small to those top um languages we've certainly seen an increase in um some of those african languages and asian languages did you want to maybe touch on that claire yeah, definitely. I mean, Mandarin and Cantonese are always the probably in the top 10 languages. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, it's interesting for us to see even just kind of iteratively over the years, those um, changing growths of communities and, you know, the the having a child and the child going through the educational system. And because we really are servicing so many different areas of of um you know, uh, government services, we really are seeing that shift from, you know, the, the older languages like Italian and Greek, for example, that Liz mentioned, to, you know, Burmese um, languages and, and dialects, Burmese, Karen, Kareni, and, um, you know, we also see the uh, impact of, um, you know, the, the kind of international political scene where we've got uh, recent arrivals like Rohingya communities who also mm -hmm. need um language services when they get here so it is it's just it's very interesting for us having such a broad customer base and uh, such different client types that that we really see the the differences in the language need and demand yeah it's fascinating when you see a conflict like the syrian conflict and then we will you know know that we still need to start preparing and then you'll see those languages uh, start to to flow through and it, it's fascinating to see what areas and services that they need first um, and then the flow on effect through through society and where, where we need to be ramping up um, and recruiting in those languages yeah, absolutely. I mean, we like here in Switzerland, we had to uh, find a lot of uh, Tingria interpreters and translators. That's uh, from um, um, Ethiopia. Yeah, Ethiopia, but also uh, Eritrea. Yeah. Right? And then all of a oh, sudden, yeah. we basically went from zero to like, okay, we need hundreds. Uh, and, yeah, and so it's that, and, and as Liz said, yeah, then it's basically flowing through, through well, what do you call it, kind of the system. So let's talk about that system. So how. Is there a difference in terms of interpreting for, let's say, the courts or police or um, maybe immigration, but then for, for maybe for a, for, for a healthcare setting in, in terms of the approach the interpreter would take, like maybe more neutral, more kind of facilitating? I recently had a conversation with somebody uh, in a European government, and they said there's a somewhat of a, a difference there. Do, do you see it in Australia? Do you train differently or... Uh, uh, do you have kind of a one size fits all training approach? Yeah, it's certainly not a one size fits all training approach. And um, most of the interpreters that we would um, onboard would typically have either gone through um, an undergrad or certainly a master's level. And um, one of the basic entry requirements here is uh, having a, a NATI certification. So NATI, yeah. I'm sure you've heard of, is the National Accreditation Association um, for Translators and Interpreters. Um, so that's really a basic level. And um, in the past few years, NATI has completely overhauled their certification system, um, which really um, 
it, it, the translators and interpreters will will get either a specialization in a particular area or just a generalist um, NATI qualification. Um, so, you know, you will have those tiered levels of um, service and, and qualification. Um, but in terms of actually delivering the service, we do see the difference between, you know, that high level court or hospital um, specialization that would be needed where you've got um, the traditional conveying of um, you know, one speech in one language to another, um, whereas in those more, more community settings or in the, the rare and emerging languages, as, as they're called here, we certainly see more of a facilitation where, you know, there's an explanation of concepts that are new to the community, for example, that, that just doesn't have that direct translation that you would um, in a more technical or specialised setting. Um, and we certainly see that in our telephone interpreting service as well. Mm. Um, and so, we actually have an annual innovation fund. It's uh, 150,000 that we um, funnel into research um, into different aspects of, of language services. And one of the, the programs that we're um, funding at the moment is research into telephone interpreting standards and, and guidelines. And um, certainly the, the, uh, what's come from that is there's a much higher use of the third person, for example. It's much more of a facilitation. And, um, you know, that's that's due in part to the breadth of languages that we service, but also, um, you know, that lack of visibility of, of visual cues. So it, it's much more of a facilitation rather than a direct interpreting that we would traditionally know. That's really cool. I was going to ask about this, uh, yeah, the Industry, industry Innovation Fund as well. Do you have any other examples of... Um you know, in research initiatives or, or what it's kind of led to in the past few years? Yeah, maybe just to jump in there and to lead on from what Claire was saying. Um, indeed, and I guess it goes back to who we are, um, given that we are owned by um, the government, I guess we have more of an emphasis on giving back to the, the sector. And so our fund is a part of that. So as Claire mentioned, we've done research into telephone interpreting, into uh, interpreting in mental health settings, um, into simultaneous interpreting in courts. And we've currently uh, got a, um, a research program running. It's a mentorship program in court settings. So taking those interpreters from those more what we call rare and emerging languages and pairing them with um, a more higher volume uh, interpreter with more experience and, and higher level NATI qualification. So that's something that's going on. But probably the most um, innovative is a, a research project at the moment with Monash University. And so that is a virtual reality training program uh, for interpreting or preparing interpreters to work in family violence settings um, and so as you can imagine that's probably one of the most complex intense um, assignments or that you could be a part of and so it's really about trying to prepare um, interpreters as, as best we can in those incredibly cha challenging environments. So it's a fully immersive training experience. So before they've stepped foot in a, in a court or a, a hospital or potentially even in the middle of the night into a home visit where you've potentially got police, the perpetrator, you've got children, you've got the, the individual who requires um, an interpreter, incredibly complex situation that you're navigating, let alone the interpreting that you you then have to undertake. So yeah, it, it will be launched later in the year um, and that is that would just be the first module, um, a family violence uh, immersive training experience and then we'll, we'll take it from there and, and develop um, other modules on the back of that. So that's with like VR. Yeah, it's with the VR goggles. goggles or... Yeah. Wow. Okay. That's next level. I guess you could use it so, for any other thing as well. I mean, that's one yeah. application. But like we're talking about courts or or any other sort of domain of interpreting potentially. Oh, absolutely. Family violence is probably the most complex yeah. uh, setting um, and challenging. So we wanted to start with that. But of course, court setting would be another example or, um, you know, working in a, a police setting. You call again, maybe perhaps you're, you're called into, um, yeah, a, a police. Um, uh, I can't even think of the name. <laughs> a police headquarters. Station. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Station. A police station, that was so difficult, a police station. Um, and again, they're, they're just high stress, um, complex environments that you're interpreting in. So, yeah, I, sorry, I'm just, I'm processing the, the fact that you're training or you're planning to train with VR goggle. I mean, there's so many additional applications and this VR has been kind of this perpetual promise, but it's, it's you know, it's probably for 
the exception of some niche use cases. I've never seen it in this industry. So um, in, interesting to think about the implications of that. Yeah. Let's absolutely. take a bit of a 30,000 foot, as the Americans, I guess, would say, uh, <laughs> view or 10,000 meter view, uh, as we here would say, uh, about the industry, specifically Australia, your business. Like, what's the outlook for the next you know, two to three years? Let's say we get past COVID, things are opening up. Uh, how do you see your, your company developing? I mean, uh, from a translations point of view, um, you know, we're only going to uh, leverage our technology more and more. So um, we're certainly working closely with our customers now to enable um, integrations into their content management systems. I mean, that's that's just really happening for us now. And so that's certainly where I'm going to be taking um, the, the translations department to the next step, really um, kind of almost acting as that, that consultant as well for our, our customers. You know, part, it's, it's, it's not just being a, a language services provider, you're, you're becoming a partner, you know, you're, you're consulting them on, on um, you know, the entire customer journey, looking at what they need, what their outcomes are and um, what they what they want to achieve. Um, I think we we also we launched our multilingual SMS technology this year, so we'll also be looking to develop um, that technology a bit a bit further. So um, that's really again to assist our customers with their multilingual um, SMS campaigns and again reaching their their customers in a, a just another way. Um, yeah, maybe to add to that, I mean, the government, um, especially the, the Victorian government here has a huge focus on, on language services. So we'll continue growing within government and I think trying to uh, provide an even more effective and efficient um, service. So there's board sort of policy instruments that, that are driving us to, to continue delivering a more high quality service with those insights that we spoke about earlier. But definitely on the commercial side, there's just huge opportunity. So we've identified um, sectors that we're not currently in that, that we want to go after and, and grow and really coming from that perspective of um, that customer touch point so that customer journey and you know here all the lingo is about personalization um, and delighting the customer and I guess w when we talk to clients it's around well um, as Claire said, I think it's actually 26% of um, Australians speak a language other than English. 49% of us were either born overseas or have a parent born overseas. If you're still communicating only in English, you are just missing a, a huge opportunity to build that deeper engagement, that stickiness. Um, and, you know, as you know, marketing costs are huge. The cost of churn, you know, when customers just move from one, um, you know, utility or financial services to the next, that has a huge cost to the, to the entity. So it's really about growing through, um, I guess, bringing that awareness of the, the benefit of communicating in language. Um, and if you're only communicating in, in English, you're actually missing a, a huge opportunity. So we're really pres positioning ourselves to, to, to drive that growth and leverage those opportunities. Okay, that was great. Thanks so much, Claire. Thanks so much, Liz, for joining us at this uh, late hour over there in Australia. And thanks so much for joining. It was really interesting having you on. <laughs> thanks, Lauren. Thanks, Esther. Thanks, 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 Lauren. Thanks, Esther.